Today was the day where we find out which rules pass, which rules don't, which ones are tabled, which usually means that we're never going to hear from them again. But, so, but sometimes, sometimes they resurface. One of the things that passed that, as of earlier this week, Peter King said he wasn't so sure it would, this half measure for incorporating video technology into getting calls right. I'm a firm believer in booth umpire. I've been for years an advocate of adding a member to the officiating crew in black and white stripes, sitting in the booth, seeing everything we see at home and talking to the officials about any and all mistakes they make, just like and with the same powers of someone who's on the, the on-field crew. What the NFL has approved today, Shereen, is enhancement to the replay assistance functions. And specifically... The replay assistant will advise the on-field officials on, quote, specific objective aspects of a play when clear and obvious video evidence is present or to address game administration issues. Now, this means catching pass, feet in bounds, objective things, not, hey, the guy from the Rams just blew up the guy from the Saints and it was pass interference and you didn't throw a flag, you better throw a flag. That's what I'd like to have them able to do. Under this expansion of the replay assistance function, Shireen, that still is not fixable. Well, you know, Peter wrote in his column that the reason it might not pass is there was a lot of confusion about exactly how much leeway the replay assistant was going to have. And I'm still confused about it, how much power this person is going to have. They're not part of the crew, so are they going to feel comfortable calling down or doing whatever they do? And how much are they going to do that? And is it going to vary stadium by stadium, which I guarantee you it is, where if you have the, the booth umpire as a part, the sky judge as part of that team, they're going to do that. Now, I talked to Troy Vincent two years ago when this first came up, Mike, and we were proponents of it and still are. I talked to Troy Vincent, Vincent a long time about it after the competition committee meeting. And the two things he said that the reason that officials don't like it or the, it, it, the competition committee hasn't pushed for it, one reason is who are those replay officials? Like, how do you go out and find them? Everybody wants to be an on-field official. So do you get retired officials? That's probably the route you go. Are there enough of those guys to do that, to join all those crews? So there was a concern about exactly who those sky judges were going to be. And then the second thing was, they're now part of the crew, and how comfortable are they going to be overturning the guy on the field, but or female on the field, whoever it is, the official on the field. But, hey, don't make mistakes on the field. That's what that person is there to do to correct it. I mean, let's get it right, and if you err, let's get that fixed. If I make an error, I want you to tell me, hey, you made an error, and I fixed this. Let's get it right. Let's not worry about who's making the correct call. Let's just get the call right, Mike. Well, and I still think the referee would be in charge and have final say. I don't think you give ultimate authority over the on-field officiating to the booth umpire or sky judge, whatever rule that you would apply. It's just the benefit of the perspective that millions at home have. That continues to be a disconnect that must be addressed by the NFL. You've got seven people who see it one way, and you've got millions who see it another way. Those people at home are the ones who are reacting to these calls. So if you have someone with a thorough knowledge of the rules, with the authority to speak directly to the referee, just like when we see them on the field caucusing all the time, we see groups of officials together and they're talking about this and they work it out just like that image right there. They're working it out. They're talking about it before they make a decision. The booth umpire, sky judge, talks to all of them or could push the button like the producers do with us. You decide who you're going to talk to. Talk to the referee. Talk to everyone at once. Talk to the field judge. You can hit the button and talk to that person and only that person if you need to. But there's a way to do it that doesn't undermine the authority of the referee. There's a way to do it that takes advantage of the skills, the knowledge, the abilities of some older referees, on-field officials who no longer are physically able to do it but still want to be involved like an Ed Hockley. And Shereen, I I hate to say it, but I, I, if, I, if I really hated to say it, I wouldn't say it. I'm going to say it. It's about money at some level. It's about money. They don't want to pay. They don't see the incremental benefit for the money that they put into having 17 additional employees who would be paid officiating salary, part of the union. Now we got to deal with this. It's going to cost us more money. How much better are things going to be 
for the extra money that we put in when we can just instead lump additional duties onto the replay assistant. They're already there. They're already getting paid. And and I heard from somebody who who knows very well the inner workings of the officiating department. The replay assistant's already got enough to do. This isn't going to help that person do their job better. And that confusion about replay assistant versus the command center, you know, there's already some authority that Al Riveron or his designee has over administrative issues. Where does the line get drawn between what the replay assistant does and what they do in the league office? What if the replay assistant's getting it wrong? When does the league office get involved? I, I just, I don't like this because it still creates the opportunity for a debacle. And eventually, the next debacle, there's going to be one. The next one, whichever one it is, there's going to be one that results in millions of dollars changing hands via legally wagered bets. It's going to get politicians up in arms. It's going to get a criminal prosecution launched. Is someone correct? You don't need any of that. If you take care of your own backyard, if you make sure these things don't happen, if you make sure these problems don't arise in an era where there are 30, 35, 40 states with legalized gambling and we're heading that way, you don't have that blowback. That's what they need to be worried about. And I'm stunned they're not more concerned about that. If they were, we'd have a booth umpire. And you know what, Mike? They didn't learn their lesson. They had an opportunity to do that. The 2018, as we know, NFC Championship game ended as it should not have ended. They didn't get the call right. They didn't throw a flag on obvious pass interference. That didn't happen. And you would think they would have done something at that point to fix it. So what did they do? They put in, oh, we'll review pass interference for a year. And they did that, and that went away. And everybody seems to have forgotten what happened, anybody outside of New Orleans anyway, seems to have forgotten what happened in that game. They got it wrong, Mike. The Saints probably would have gone on to the Super Bowl. They didn't get to go because of that call. And I just think that it's time that the NFL fixes this before this happens in a Super Bowl when there is an even bigger uproar than there was in that game, Mike. And it wasn't just... <laughs> Something that they tried and decided we don't like it. It was a disaster when they made pass interference calls and non-calls, offensive and defense subject to replay review because it was poorly implemented. It, it, the, I never felt like they had a cohesive set of rules as to how specific and particular the scrutiny applied by Al Riveron was going to be. And I remember when we started to hear about how he was interpreting past plays and how those plays would have been changed if replay review was available. And he was being very technical, very specific, looking for clear and obvious evidence of impairment of the opportunity of the defensive player or the offensive player to make that play on the ball. And it was like, oh, my gosh, that's that. No, that's not what this should be for. This should be for the truly egregious know it when you see it call that's missed. So now I think they've gone the other way. And what they've decided, Shireen, is what I feared they were going to decide in the aftermath of the Rams Saints debacle. By the time it happens again, I'll be gone. I think that's the attitude each individual in this has. It's not going to happen again anytime soon. And I'm willing to roll the dice that this is a mess that I won't personally have to deal with. Someone else, years from now, hopefully decades from now, will be the one that has to deal with that mess. We'll let them clean it up. We're just going to assume that what happened in the Rams Saints game is a once in a hundred year problem that by the time it happens again, we'll all be dead. I, I, just, I feel like that's the attitude that finally was adopted by the competition committee and ownership generally. Let somebody else deal with this problem because we don't want to spend the money to do it right. We don't feel compelled to do it right because we're not going to get stung again. The odds are we're not going to have this problem anytime soon. Yeah, frankly, Mike, all they're worried about is the postseason games, right? If it happens in the regular season, yeah, it's an uproar, big deal. It's it's one game, it's a regular season game. You throw that out the door, not a big deal. So they need it not to happen in the postseason. And you're right, they're just rolling the dice now that it's not going to happen, that it, eventually when it does happen, they're long gone. And they may be right. We may not see this for another 10 years or 20 years or whatever, but they are rolling the dice that this could happen and there could be a bad call that's not fixable in a Super Bowl. I think a primetime regular season game with a big audience could be a problem. I think if that it's tucked be. into the 1 yeah. o'clock Eastern games, it goes unnoticed. The, the horrendous phantom roughing the passer call against the Lions in the Vikings game week 17 last that's year. Right. Nobody noticed. Nobody cared. It was It was 
horrendous. And if it happened in a game that anybody actually cared about, it would have been a major, major, major uproar. Uh, I, I, I'll say this. I believe in following the rules as written because otherwise, why have the rules? But I also believe that Al Riveron or someone else should have on the wall the emergency break glass that they can use <laughs> when absolutely necessary to fix what what obviously will be a major controversy the next day and beyond. And I've said this before. If all Al Riveron had done in that Ram Saints game is buzzed in and said, drop a flag. Wait, what, what do you mean? Just trust me. We're all going to be better off if you drop a flag, call defensive pass interference. You can thank me later. He was too rigid in following the rules. You know, one of the best things about knowing the rules is knowing when to break the rules. And if he had done that, <laughs> we wouldn't need we wouldn't be we wouldn't be having a discussion about replay assistant or yeah. sky judge or booth umpire there wouldn't have been a year where there was this shifting bizarre standard as to what pass interference on replay review was or wasn't so maybe maybe now between the replay assistant and the league office being involved and having a voice maybe what this means is that if there is another ram saints horrendous non-call Somebody will say something to someone and it'll get fixed in a way that doesn't technically comply with the rules, but that avoids the disaster. I, I root for that outcome if it ever comes to that. And of course, we'll never know and we shouldn't know. I'm fine with it as long as they avoid that debacle. Yeah, and the thing is, Mike, if they had dropped that flag, even if they drop it late in the Rams Saints game, the Rams are not going to have an argument with that other than, hey, that was a really late flag. Yeah, it was a late flag, but you know what? It was the right call. So they're not going to have much of an argument. And you're right. There is a time to break the rules. That was it. They didn't do it. And now we're still here trying to fix this problem from three years ago, trying to figure out how not to let that happen again. And this is a half-baked idea that they've come up with to, to try to fix that problem. And, and maybe next time they'll throw the flag. Maybe they'll do that. Let's hope. I guarantee you if it had come out in the aftermath of that game that they had violated protocol to have the league office, Al Riveron, contact the referee and say drop a flag, if that had come out, it wouldn't have been a big what – would, what would the Rams have done? Would they have, would they have boycotted watching right. the Super Bowl in L.A. the way they boycotted New Orleans? No, because <laughs> they got away with something they shouldn't have gotten away with. How can you be upset yeah. about it if the rules get fudged in a way to keep you from getting an unfair outcome? So I agree with you, and hopefully that's what will happen the next time. The next time there's an onside kick in an NFL game, there'll be a better chance of the kicking team recovering. In lieu of enacting that 4th and 15 proposal that I frankly love, I think they should use the 4th and 15 play for all kickoffs. What they're doing is limiting the number of players on the receiving team that can be in that setup zone between 10 and 25 yards from the spot where the ball is kicked. The maximum is now 9. Usually you've got 10 or 11 defensive players, so it's a numbers game. One or two fewer bodies, maximum of nine, trying to receive it. Maybe there's a better chance that the kicking team will recover because of the configuration changes that have been made in an effort to reduce injuries during regular kickoff plays and onside kickoff plays. I mean, the onside kickoff in the old days was a car crash galore. It was 11 guys crashing into 11 guys and somebody trying to get their hands on the football. So, Shireen, I don't know how it's going to work. They want the kicking team. They want the team that's trailing to have a better chance to get back into the game. They're going to try this. And my guess is if we don't see a, a noticeable increase in the opportunity for the team that's kicking that onside kick to recover the ball, that's when fourth and 15 becomes a viable option. I'm still surprised they haven't adopted it because I, I talked to somebody several months ago who thought that fourth and 15 was going to make it. And this may be the last ditch alternative before fourth and 15 becomes a reality. I'm not surprised, Mike. These owners are so conservative. Like, they see that as an XFL play. We're not putting that in our game, you know. I I'll be surprised if 4th and 15 ever passes. I think it would be fun. I think it would be great. I would love to see it. I don't know that it ever passes. We'll see what happens with this if the percentages go up. So, since they've done away with the running start on kickoffs, in 2019, there were 63 onside kicks. Eight were recovered. Last season, 27 onside kicks. 
three were recovered. And you remember that Dallas Atlanta game? They had the, the watermelon kick and the Cowboys recovered and came back. It was an exciting game. Unless you're a Falcons game, a Falcons fan, it was an exciting game, a great finish. If the Cowboys hadn't gotten that onside kick, they had no chance to win that game, to come back. And I think that's what we all like seeing, unless it's your team that's being come back on. You love seeing those comebacks. You love it come down to the wire to the team that's trailing to have a chance to win and, and give them a chance to get those onside kicks. And I do think this will help those percentages go up. We'll see as the year goes on. If there's more than that uh, next year, then I think we stay with this in coming years. If it doesn't, maybe they do consider the fourth and 15 and we do go to that, which again, I would love to see it, Mike. I think it would be an exciting play in football, you can only do it probably a certain number of times, maybe just once a game, but it would be so exciting to to see that play uh, in the league in lieu of the onside kick. Roger Goodell was asked several years ago which team he roots for. He said the team that's trailing. The NFL wants those exciting yeah. games. We saw a lot of double-digit comebacks last year, I think, because stadiums were empty. Whether you're trailing or whether you're ahead and you're, if you're, whether you're the visiting team and you don't have to worry about the crowd noise or you're the home team, you don't have to worry about the booing that ensues. We saw a lot of those swings, and the NFL loves that when the team that's down 14, 21, however many points has a chance to come back. Single digits will be uh, – in high demand in NFL locker rooms now that the proposal, which kind of came out of the blue a few weeks ago from the Kansas City Chiefs, passed easily, as Peter King suggested it would. Running backs, receivers, tight ends, linebackers, defensive backs, all can now wear single-digit numbers. The caveat that we posted today, though, if there's already an inventory of your current number and you want to change now, you got to pay for that unsold inventory of jerseys. We'll see how badly some of these guys want it. Adrian Peterson wanted to change his number a few years back, and he found out what it was going to cost to do it. And he said, oh, I'll, I'll just I'll stick, with, I'll stick with the number I have. Thank you very much. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. But beyond that, there's going to be maybe rock, paper, scissors. There's going to be all sorts of competition within locker rooms to see who gets those single-digit numbers because there's going to be a lot of guys who want them. There's going to be guys who want to take them from punters and kickers. There's going to be guys who maybe want to take them from backup quarterbacks. That part of it's going to be fun to see play out, Shireen. Yeah, and players coming into the league, Mike, they'll now have a chance to select those numbers, especially, you know, we know number two is going to be very popular with the Rams. A couple guys have already said they want number two, so maybe they have rock, paper, scissors to determine who gets number two and uh, with the Rams. But, yeah, I think that's an interesting thing you wrote about, though, having to buy that inventory and how many of those jerseys are left. But, Mike, what happens to those jerseys? Does the player then get those jerseys and get to sell them himself or give them out, or how does that work? I assume if I paid for them, I'm getting them. And you're right. If I want to autograph them and sell them, I'll sell them. I'll do whatever I want with them. But if I got to pay for them, I want them. Give me them, even though they're not nearly as valuable as the jerseys that have the guy's current number. You know, another wrinkle to this, too, a topic we talked about several weeks back when J.J. Watt joined the Arizona Cardinals. What happens if there's a star player who wants to wear a single-digit number that just so happens to be retired by the retired. team that that player plays for. We know about retired jersey numbers. They're retired until they're not. And that is something. And actually, I have an idea now. Hopefully, I'll remember to do it later tonight. I'm going to go back through and find all the retired single-digit numbers for each team and say, hey, we, 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 may, we may see retired jerseys get unretired if the former player or his family members say, we give you our blessing to wear the jersey that supposedly was never going to be worn again. Taunting a point of emphasis this season, this seems to happen every few years. They don't want fights to happen, so they'll they'll get strict about taunting, whether you spike the ball at the feet of an opponent or spin the ball or direct something to you know a, a, an opponent, the throwing up of the deuces, even though Tyree Kill seems to get away with that a lot. He has been fined for it. They're trying to avoid any type of altercations on the field. I get it. My concern is unless and until they are truly consistent in calling that foul, yeah. giving up 15 yards of field position is a lot. And you better be. This, may, this would be a perfect thing for the booth umpire to do. Because when you're down in the fray, you may not notice it. And I think some guys are going to get away with it, and it's going to be inconsistent, and I'd rather not see it. 
Yeah, well, we go back to the Super Bowl, right? Antoine Winfield got uh, penalized 15 yards. Now, the game was out of hand. The Bucs were going to win that game, but he threw up to the, the deuces to Tyreek Hill. The reason he did that was you go back to the regular season game. Tyreek Hill did that to him on one of his touchdowns, one of his three first quarter touchdowns, and he didn't get fined for it, didn't get penalized for it. So uh, that was my question. Why wasn't Tyreek Hill penalized or, or fine for this, and you go to the Super Bowl, and it happens, and of course, it's from a lot, a lot more people are watching the game and see it and, and respond to it. But yeah, they need to be consistent. However, they do it, let them all get away with it, or or penalize them all. But yes, it's it's going to be Mike. I think some inconsistency in this. Uh, because there are going to be some things that you just don't see as an official trying to see, okay, did he get across the goal line? Oh, wait, I didn't see him put up the, the peace sign to the player behind him or whatever the case may be. But I do think we're going to see some inconsistency with this. Two quick points. First, I think one of the reasons there's inconsistency is when you've got seven officials on the field and typically multiple who are in position to maybe make that call, there's a reluctance to be what Marv Levy would call the over officious jerk, the embodiment and personification of the no fun league. Because, well, what's the big deal? And, and that's the other thing, too. What's the big deal? I get this concern well. And it used to be the, the reason for not allowing the celebrations that the league re-embraced several years back. Well, we don't want someone doing something that's going to make somebody else upset and maybe get them to fight. They're pushing and shoving and hitting each other every single play. If that doesn't piss them off to the point where they're going to fight after the play, <laughs> whether or not a guy dances into the end zone or throws up the deuces or spikes the football in the guy's face, that shouldn't make it any worse. It, 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 if anything, they should be more upset about getting blown up at the line of scrimmage and getting knocked on their butt than what may happen after the play ends. So I, I just I, I don't I don't like it. I think there should be a certain amount of it. I think these guys should be trusted to be sufficiently mature to walk away. And if they do take a swing, send them to the locker room. That's the best deterrent for that. All right, last one real quickly. The proposal to delay head coaching and GM searches has been tabled for further discussion. The Bills propose delaying the start of interviews until after the conference championship and no hires until after the Super Bowl. There's no good reason to not do this. And I think the teams looking for coaches would benefit from being forced to wait for whatever reason. The NFL wants to have that open season right after the regular season ends where the teams that stink can go out and begin interviewing assistants from the teams that are still playing, creating unavoidable distractions for guys who are trying to finish the job they have while they're focused on the job they want. And it's impossible for any human being to compartmentalize those two when you're in a busy playoff week. It's just impossible. And that becomes, whether you're going to get that job, that becomes your bigger priority than getting things ready for your team's playoff game. And and th I, th there's nothing wrong with that. That's just natural. As someone explained it to me back during this year's hiring cycle, when the guy comes home from work and his spouse asks him about his day, he's not going to be asked, how'd the game plan go for this week's playoff game? He's going to be asked, what have you heard about that job we may be getting and that place we may be moving to and that promotion that you may be getting? That's normal. That's natural. And that creates that inherent conflict, Shireen. And they need to set up a situation where that conflict isn't there for the guys who need to do the jobs they currently have. Well, and the other thing, Mike, is this year we saw no coaches beyond the divisional round get hired, right? I think that's hurt Eric Bieniemy over the last two years. And the Bucks really benefited from this because you think about what their coaches did in the postseason. They would have been down at least one coordinator and maybe two after what they did in the postseason. Both of those guys might have gotten head coaching jobs and we might have a couple of other minority coaches in, in the league, if not Eric Bieniemy as well. So I think that's hurt him so I think it will help those coaches whose teams year after year after year are making the championship game and making Super Bowls guys from that Patriots staff who who over a 20-year span were always going that far Mike I, I think they were hurt by this so that should help them too all right uh let's go ahead and take a break plenty of stuff there that was discussed even though there wasn't a lot of action in rules being passed more action necessary hopefully the NFL will make the tweaks that we have suggested at some point before they have an even bigger problem. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.